Esther chapter 6 then reading at verse 1 we'll read the whole chapter it's not very long on that night could not the king sleep and he commanded to bring the book of records of the chronicles and they were read before the king it was found written that Mordecai had told of Big Thana and Tiresh two of the king's chamberlains the keepers of the door who sought to lay a lay hand on the king Ahasuerus and the king said what honour and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this then said the king's servants that ministered unto him there is nothing done for him and the king said who is in the court now Haman was come into the outward court of the king's house to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him and the king's servant said unto him behold Haman standeth in the court and the king said let him come in so Haman came in, and the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honour? Now Haman thought in his heart, To whom would the king delight to do honour more than to myself? And Haman answered the king, For the man whom the king delighteth to honour, let the royal apparel be brought, which the king useth to wear, and the horse the king rideth upon, and the crown royal which is set upon his head. And let this apparel and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that they may array the man with all whom the king delighteth to honour, and bring him on horseback through the street of the city and proclaim before him thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honour then the king said to Haman make haste and take the apparel and the horse as thou hast said and do even so to Mordecai the Jew that sitteth at the king's gate let nothing f fail of all that thou hast spoken then took Haman the apparel and the horse and arrayed Mordecai and brought him on horseback through the street of the city and proclaimed before him thus shall it be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honour Mordecai came again to the king's gate, but Haman hasted to his house mourning and having his head covered. And Haman told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had befallen him. Then said wise men, then said his wise men and Zeresh, his wife, unto him, If Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews before whom thou hast begun to fall, thou shalt not prevail against him, but shalt surely fall before him. And while they were yet talking with him, came the king's chamberlains and hasted to bring Haman unto the banquet that Esther had prepared verse 6 we looked at didn't we last, last week at Haman as a type of antichrist which he surely is uh, verse 6 so Haman came in and the king said unto him what shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honour now Haman thought in his heart to whom would the king delight to do honour more than to myself this is often the secret whisper even in a believer's heart but of course it abounds in the hearts of unbelievers to whom would the king to whom would god more delight to take pleasure than in honoring me uh, if you never said that in your heart you're deceiving yourself um, sadly it's a secret whisper of my heart from time to time and i fear it is also yours but it's a, it's constant more or less in the hearts of the unbelieving Haman, can I remind you, is the flesh, speaks of the flesh. And though I might be a real Christian, the old man will st still speak within me at times in this way. How many preachers are proud of themselves? Preachers are supposed to be examples of humility. How often they are so proud of themselves. Preachers I'm talking about. Men who know the word of God well. How often have I heard from the pulpit a kind of good ministry but, but just seasoned with a lot of personal pomp and self-assurance and so forth which God doesn't like. I used to know a brother many years ago a very capable Bible teacher conference speaker among the brethren. Lovely brother. Very fond of him still. And uh, he told me about a conference he went to yeah, I think it was Northern Ireland, maybe Belfast. And there were two or three other speakers. And one of them insisted on being last because the last speaker was the big name. You know, the last speaker. Was, and one of the guys who was a confident speaker would not go first, nor second, nor third. He insisted on being last because he was the big name after all. So uh, let's not think we can escape this kind of attitude. The best of us, whoever they might be, um, are inclined to whisper this even in our hearts to whom would the king delight to do honour more than to myself when we were converted God didn't take away our sin nature as the so called holiness people teach uh, they say it's a mistake I, I didn't commit a sin I made a mistake well 
holy those people if, if that's what they believe they're not saved God didn't take away our sin nature when we were saved he gave us instead the spirit of Christ so that he within us should constantly mortify our sin nature Romans 8 we're going through Romans I'm trusting that we're going to get a real blessing as we go Romans 8 verse 2 for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death we are given the old nature is not taken away but we are given the holiness the righteousness of Christ the power of God to dwell in us so that we should walk as he walked and live as he lived that's what we're given as believers and I have to keep reminding myself of this because I get downcast a lot these days and I have to have the Lord remind me I'm with you my holiness is with you my righteousness is with you I've kept you thus far I'm going to keep you to the end and he will so God didn't take away our sin nature that's why we're inclined to think the kinds of things but he gives us the, the Lord that within us uh, he should mortify our sin nature we may stumble John says in his epistle if any man sin so he's conceding that that's a possibility we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ the righteous we do stumble sadly we do but we can never fail to get up again if we're the Lord's because he'll pick us up he will I've found it time and time again I might go down again before the day's over but he'll pick me up by tomorrow I trust or at some point point. and Paul speaks of that victory which I've just read to you from Romans 8 and verse 2 to whom would the king delight to do honour than more to myself we're not thinking about Haman as the antichrist this morning we're thinking about Haman again as the flesh which we have to live with there was an old um, I think I've got it in Romans 7 actually uh, a note in my Bible well we'll have a talk about making notes in your Bible we're talking about this on, on you know we'll have a chat about that after because I can I can see where you're coming from you guys that don't do it I do understand your reverence for the scripture but there is there's an argument to be made for having a wide margin Bible and putting notes in it whether you're a preacher or not but that we won't do that now um we carry this old man with us we carry this death around with us the death that we are by nature it's with us all the time here's what George Williams says an Egyptian punishment at that time was to fasten a criminal to a corpse and that attachment continued until death such a helpless and hopeless prisoner held in a bun so loathsome and fatal would cry out with anguish a wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from the body of this death that's what the sacrifice of Christ's body was all about I don't understand the theology of it just what it tells me you know I'm learning sometimes I don't have to, God didn't expect me to understand it he expected me to believe it how, how can you know do we understand how God could have made everything in six days when you think of what we are what is a man what is man that they are mindful of it? As, as Shakespeare said what a piece of work is a man how like a God and he goes on to talk about and you think about how you know if I want to I can move that finger or I can move that one just amazing and, and it's all in a seed as well so that when a woman gets impregnated and that, that egg is fertilised everything that you and I are it's, it's just incredible and God that, he did that in one day one day and we're all different furthermore so let's not try and understand Genesis chapter 1 and 2 because we won't will we we just have to believe it I, 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 it's the same when it comes to what Christ did when he died with my body I don't understand how it works but somehow somehow he nullified his power and then coming in by his spirit he gives me new life and those preachers that I've heard that are persuaded of this like Watchman Nee and Major Ian Thomas have a vibrant ministry because they've got hold of this and I want to get hold of it too that the life of Christ is in us as Christians we are given we are not given the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind it's wonderful to whom would the king delight to do honor more than to myself i believe there's a mental illness chris is not here this morning otherwise he'd be able to confirm or deny not that he's got it i'm not suggesting that there's a there's a mental illness called delusions of grandeur you know they say that sometimes you get the old mental hospitals most of which are shut now of course uh, which is probably a good idea actually um there were those, you know, there were people there who thought they were Napoleon. There were people who thought they were Julius Caesar. Delusions of grandeur. There are lots of people today who think they are Jesus Christ. Delusions of grandeur. 
And this is something that, that it seems Haman has got here. To whom would the king delight to do honor more than to myself? And when you think, and I think like that, we've got delusions of grandeur. Not perhaps clinically, not so much that they need to lock us up, because we keep that to ourselves very well. The youth are particularly prone to this. Because they're young, they're often filled with ideas of what great musicians may be or great footballers they're going to be by the time they get maybe to 30. That at length, their, their wonderful gifts will appear to a marvelling world. And uh, my own head was filled with such nonsense. All through my teens and early 20s, I was sure we were going to make it big when I was a drummer. And uh, so many, so many youngsters have got their heads filled with this idea that they should be honoured above all. It's something to watch out for as a youngster. But it affects us all our lives. We probably learn by the time we're over 40 to 50 that we're not going to be the great people we thought we were. <laughs> if you're over 50, you probably know that's true. <laughs> or maybe if you're over 40. We don't turn out, often we don't turn out to be, and so we get very depressed about it. We don't turn out to be the people we thought we were going to be. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. So as I say, my own head was filled with what a great musician I was going to be, what a great famous band we were going to be in all those years from around 15 to 24 when I was a drummer. Now I have in the past changed the type of the king here in Esther from from God to the soul of man uh, as we have studied thus far but it seems in this chapter the king I'm talking about best to represent God again fallen man and carnal Christians think that God ought to honour them above all others Peter thought this way once the apostle Peter uh, Matthew 26 he thought he was special Peter I'm getting to love Peter because I'm discovering that I'm like him. Matthew 26, 33, verse 33. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples, I've all got this problem. But Peter's foremost. I daren't talk about Peter because I shall end up in tears. But maybe another day. And I have met this kind of attitude sometimes with smug, unteachable Christians. I mean real Christians. I've met with this smugness. Their Bible knowledge couldn't cover the back of a postage stamp, but they talk as if they were Chrysostom or Erasmus or even the Apostle Paul. And sadly, I have to confess to my shame, perhaps I think that way sometimes too. I've been reading the Bible for about 45 years. Maybe more than most because I'm a preacher, so I'm, I'm, I have to. I don't know whether that's true, but maybe. I've read it quite a lot over 45 years. I've maybe been through the whole Bible 20 times, maybe more. The New Testament, maybe 100 times. I don't know. I don't know. I don't say that to boast. I'm just telling you, it's a fact. In fact, I'm saying that to say this. I sometimes have the stupid idea that I can't learn anything from the Bible. I think, well, while I read the Gospels, I've read the Gospels 100 times. What, what can I possibly find from the Gospels? I find every time I picked it up this week, I've learned something new. It's a real problem that we think we know something. There's a, I used to be into yoga, all sorts of junk. I'll tell you, before I was saved, all kinds of junk. And I was into yoga and I was into their ridiculous platitudes that they used to come out with. And I'm just trying to think of, of the one that says something like... Um, he that knows nothing and knows not that he knows nothing is a fool. Shun him. He that knows nothing and knows that he knows nothing is teachable. Teach him. He that knows and knows he knows is wise. Follow him. Sounds great, doesn't it? <laughs> but you see, it's a real problem when you think you know something. 
it's a real problem for me that I, I think I have a familiarity with the Gospels. And the Lord has been saying to me of late, like, you know, you, you want to learn of me, read the Word. Read the Gospels in particular. He's been saying this to me. Come unto me, all you that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. And I want to learn about the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to learn how much he loves me. I want to learn how good he is. I want to learn how kind he is. Because I think the more I know him, the more quiet my heart will be, the more I'll speak of him. God is in greatly interested in your spin on prophecy whether it's right or wrong do you love the Lord Jesus we lay so much store by what we know by what we don't know and really what we should be seeking is who do we know and who do we speak about some people like to talk about their church I couldn't give a monkey so I've never passed out tracks invited anybody to church I couldn't care less when I pass out tracks I'm inviting people to Christ and it's a real pain, it's a real, what well, the pain's not the right word. It's a real waste of time and energy for so many that just invite people to church. And half the time, the church doesn't preach the gospel anyway. Our business is to call people, to lead people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll do that when we love him. There's nothing attractive about Jesus from a man or a woman that doesn't love him. It's when we love him. He will draw through us, he will draw people to himself. And that's what matters. Not whether, not whether they come to our church or not, but whether they find Christ or not. Now, I don't think there are many sound churches in Dudley, personally. I mean, Andy would have a better idea than me, but I don't think there are many sound churches in Dudley. So if I won't get saved, I'd rather it came here. But that's not because I want these chairs filled. What concerns me is, does that man or woman know the Lord Jesus? That's, that's all that matters. That's all we should aim for. And that's all I should be preaching. Verses 7 to 9. And Haman answered the king, For the man whom the king delighteth to honour, let the royal apparel be brought, which the king useth to wear, and the horse that the king rideth upon, and a crown royal which is set upon his head. And let this apparel and a horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that they may array the man with all whom the king delighteth to honour, and bring him on a horse back through the street of the city, and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honour. So here is Haman's personal delusion of grandeur. He wants to be like the king. We saw this last week. It's, uh, Antichrist entertains and will entertain. I suspect he's alive by now. Personally, he will entertain the same delusion that he's the man who ought to be honoured. And yet all Haman is and all Antichrist is is unchecked human nature ripened to maturity. That's what the Antichrist is. He's unchecked human nature, ripened to maturity, for want of a better word. Come to the full. If God doesn't check us, we're in serious trouble, and that's what Antichrist will be like. And but for the grace of God, we'll all end, we would all end as vain and godless and as wicked as Haman. But for the grace of God. But for the grace of God. If you don't believe that, then you're making God a liar, not me. That's in accordance with Scripture. Verse 10. Then the king said to Haman, Make haste and take the apparel and the horse, as thou hast said, and do even so to Mordecai the Jew. Talk about having your bubble burst. How galling this was for Haman to hear. He's made to honour the man whom he hates above all. The Lord Jesus teaches us to love our enemies and to pray for them who persecute us and despitefully use us. There's a difference right off between the carnal response and the response that the Lord Jesus looks for. We're to pray for our enemies. We're taught to give honour to whom honour is due. Now, uh, Mordecai I clearly knew that honour was not due to Haman. Besides, we've talked about the histories of their Haman being an Agagite and so forth. We've talked about it all over the past. If the Lord is pleased to use and bless a man in his service above us, we ought to rejoice in God, God's favour to him. Two preachers turn up at the same gig. The best man's the one that's willing to turn it down, in my view. The brother insists on taking the platform is probably the more carnal of the two. That's just my view. 
it's happened to me I can't and to be honest I don't remember whether I stood down or not <laughs> it's probably happened to Andy as well you know the, the secretary makes a boo-boo and the two of you turn up and you're both ready to preach the man that stands down it seems to me is the more spiritual of the two because he recognises that maybe this brother is more competent and I've seen that in Andy and I thank God for it some brethren would not be so competitive if they were content to have others praised above them. This is New Testament teaching. Humble yourselves. We are to humble ourselves. It doesn't apply just to preachers. Go on, I'm just using preachers as an example. But there wouldn't be half the competitiveness there is if we esteemed our brother above ourselves as we taught to do in Romans 12. It, it, it amazes me, you know, I've seen this in so many areas. Uh, as a driving instructor, I did pretty well. I, I, I went pretty highly in the ranks. And I'd hear people criticising me, and they clearly didn't know what they were talking about. You know, I've known, I, 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 I had pupils, you know, I'm telling them, do this, do this, do this. And they think they know better, they go and find another instructor. We do this with the Word of God. We think we know better, so we go somewhere else, or we put the TV on, or we go to YouTube, or whatever it is. And how commonplace now with men to say, oh, this verse is translated wrong. We need another Bible, I'll make a translation. I said to Jean the other day, you know, a modern Bible is like a lifeboat with a hole in it. It looks like it's going to save you. It looks like you might get rescued, but when you get that boat, mate, and the ship's got out of sight, you're fighting, what's going on here? What's going on here? And these are the new Bibles, they've got holes in them. We'll, we'll leave that there, shall we? We shall be rewarded for our own service in due time. You remember Peter looked back and John 21, what shall this man do? The Lord says, let's put it like the modern Bibles would put it. Mind your own business. Don't keep looking at your brother, comparing yourself with your brother. You do and I must do what God calls us to do. And if our brother passes us, and many young men that I have talked to the pastor have gone past me big time spiritually, well, I just want to do the work that God's given me to do. Nearly all my life I've preached to a handful of people. Prayer meetings in the past there'll be three of us, four of us. I've had to learn to be content in a day of small things. And Brother Andy's not even knows what it's like. And there's contentment there. Let's not try and be what we're not. Let's not try and do not do what God has called us. Personally, I think the big mega churches, even if the preachers are sound, are, are not right. When the Lord fed the multitudes, he got them to sit down in companies of 50. I think that's about as big as a congregation ought to be, personally. How can a pastor care for 3,000 people? Give me a break. What he should do, if he was a, a, a real man of God, he should say, well, I want this elder to take 50 and go over there, there and put a church up over there. I want this elder here to take another 50 and put a church up over there. But they don't do that, don't they? Because the, the big congregations look good and the man feels good. Well, I'm not, you know, if the Lord blesses them, praise God for that. And if the Lord rewards them in glory, I'll praise God for that. But big churches are anomalous. Whether the teaching is corrupt, which it usually is, or sound. Some people like John MacArthur, I don't personally think much of him because uh, of his heresies on the blood he thinks the blood perished in the ground that can't be possible the blood of Jesus is the incorruptible blood it's in the glory he preaches heresy on that, in that respect but he's got a massive congregation now there may be much to commend his ministry for all I know but the congregation ought to be that big I know of others that, that seem to be sound on the gospel with huge congregations men that I would listen to but the congregation it's not, it's not right and it certainly wouldn't be right in this country where there's hardly a decent church to be found anywhere. There used to be an old saying, you know, uh, the nearer the church, the further from God. <laughs> there's a lot of truth in that now, unless you live across the road. Verse 11. Then took Haman the apparel and the horse and arrayed Mordecai and brought him on horseback through the street to the city and proclaimed before him, thus shall it be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honour. Now there's something really shocking here about the flesh remember Haman is the flesh and Mordecai is Christ unbelievers and professing Christians will give lip service and false praise to Jesus even while they hate him that's what Christendom is all about it's Haman prepared to walk Jesus as it were through the streets while, he, while they hate him in their hearts that's probably filling most of the churches today 
people that don't really love the Lord Jesus Christ but they they just pay lip service because they think God's pleased with that like the king Haman did it because the king would be pleased with it. men think God will be pleased if I go to church men think God will be pleased if I sing this hymn and if I say that about Jesus well their hearts are far from him that's Christendom many are in churches this morning because they're afraid of God just as Haman was afraid of the king but at the same time they hate him now the Lord accused the Jews of this I'm not making this up the Lord accused the Jews of this um, and many who seek to praise the Lord today are exactly the same Mark chapter 7 Mark chapter 7 what are we doing for time but okay Mark 7 verse 6 he answered and said unto them well hath Isaiah that's Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites as it is written this people honoureth me with their lips but their heart is far from me that's a quote from Isaiah 29 I'll read you that as well Isaiah 29 and verse 13 Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honour me, but have removed their heart from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. They're just like Haman. And the churches are full of people, I feel like this this morning. When I was first saved in my naivety, I never would have believed that any man would honour the Lord Jesus who didn't love him. Surprising how the Bible changes your view of things. I, I, as a naive you say, I never, I never, as far as I know, God knows, I never would have named the name of Jesus until I got saved. Before I got saved, Christianity was just for old women who got nothing else to do. Read the Bible coming for their funeral. Um, you know, it was, Christianity was, was for simpletons. When I got saved, I was willing to name the name of Jesus. And I could never understand, I didn't believe that anybody would name the name of Jesus who wasn't saved, but they do. They do. The Bible will make us wise to what's going on in the churches. How faithful and honest this morning is your profession? And mine. I'm not saying you're not a Christian, but if we praise him, we should seek to do so in spirit and in truth. We should look out for this kind of lip service. Uh, I, I sometimes won't sing a hymn. Occasionally I won't sing a hymn because I think I'm not there. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite with I withhold. Can you sing that and, and hold your hand up and say, Lord, I mean it. <laughs> Perhaps it would be better not to sing it if you don't mean it sometimes many times the last once I haven't wanted to sing praise the Lord because I couldn't but Jean bless her heart said to me you should do so for the sake of the saints put on a brave face you know the Lord knows your heart put on a brave face and praise him anyway and I think there's something to be said for that but there are times that I cannot sing a particular verse take my silver and my gold really not a mic with I withhold really do you sing it do you mean it? I think we wouldn't sing, we probably wouldn't sing all of it. It'd be even quieter, wouldn't it, if we took ourselves seriously when it came to him singing. But, you know, maybe sometimes we need to do it to, to stir our hearts, to think as we ought to think. So I'm not telling you to be silent when somebody gives a hymn out. But let's examine ourselves and see, are we guilty of this kind of Haman stuff? Praising his name and the, the, what, at the same time we're thinking about what we're going to have for lunch. we should be looking to the Lord Jesus that we might walk the talk and we won't do it without him you've often heard it said no doubt you know people say the Christian life is hard it isn't hard it's impossible it's impossible we cannot live it without Jesus I've been finding out more than ever I found out I cannot live it without the Lord Jesus Christ I can't stand before you this morning unless he holds up these weak and trembling legs Well, things are going from bad to worse 
for Haman. And uh, we'll see now how that develops, God willing, next week. Some some amazing stuff in chapter 7 as well. It's an extraordinary book is the book of Esther. The, the pictures, the gospel pictures are amazing. And we'll, maybe we'll get into that next week, but we'll move on, Lord willing, to the denouement, as they say, to uh, to Abraham, uh, sorry, Haman getting his comeuppance. Uh, in chapter 7, some great truths to be had there. Pray for me, please, that God will help me prepare the ministry. Uh, pray for me that the Lord will get me past my anxieties and I'll be able to prepare the ministry and give the ministry. Amen. Oh, pudding. You remember last week we had some pudding? Commentators, I've got a couple. Just a couple of quotes here. John Trapp, you knew John Trapp would come up. The king had one special horse, as had also David, Alexander, Julius Caesar, and so forth. That was what, what Haman wanted to sit on. Trapp again says, The difference between the gentleman and the peasant is that the peasant never rides, the gentleman never goes on foot. And you can find Solomon confirms that in the book of Ecclesiastes. And Trapp goes on to say, Haman was forced to proclaim, and that on foot as a servant, when Mordecai as a prince in his state was on horseback. So that's interesting. That's all it is, it's interesting. Joseph Hall, Bishop Hall, tremendous man of God. I've, I've learned this week that Trapp quotes Hall, Matthew Henry quotes Hall, George Whitfield used to read Hall. The Contemplations of Bishop Hall, if you, if you, if you want some real deep stuff, I recommend the con Contemplations of Bishop Hall. He says this, uh, he has Haman comforting himself this way, quote, Mordecai, I will honour thee now, but by these steps I may ere long raise thee many cubits higher. I will obey the command of my sovereign in observing thee, that he may reward the merit of my loyalty in thine execution. So Joseph Hall is saying he did it, but he's got other thoughts in the future for, for Mordecai. I will leave it there. Amen. Sunday, as I've already said, we're here at 10 o'clock and uh, it's going to be speaking on Haven and the developments and the banquet in chapter 7. <laughs>